main, uh, the main big claim here for the, the idea of replacing philosophy or um, this radical therapeutic program is that most or maybe all philosophical concepts are inconsistent. And the, the idea of an inconsistent concept is one that I've pushed for quite a long time. An inconsistent concept is one that has a false constitutive principle, really is the, um, I think the cleanest definition. The term inconsistent comes from the idea that the constitutive principles for the concept are inconsistent with reality. They, they're contradict, they contradict the way that, the, that, uh, that reality actually is or what's true about the world or something like that. And so uh, I've made a big deal out of the concept of truth and saying that the concept of truth is inconsistent and it's that inconsistency, that defect in the concept that leads to the liar paradox and uh, other paradoxes associated with truth. It's not that we're making some kind of mistake we're using the concept according to its constitutive principles. And in doing so, we're led to a contradiction. And uh, it's the, you know, most of the approaches to, um, to the liar paradox have been, you know, identifying this mistake that we're making. But according to an inconsistency approach, there's no mistake that we're making, we're not doing something wrong. We're following the rules of the concept of truth or the meaning of the word true, along with the meanings of other words like you know, logical terms and so forth. And in, in so doing, we end up with a contradiction. And that's because the meaning of the word true or the, the principles that are, you know, that implicitly define or are constitutive of the concept of truth are inconsistent. You can reason with them to a contradiction. Okay, so. Um, so I'm, I'm just explaining the idea that most or all philosophical concepts are inconsistent in the same way. So the idea is that the, the, the problems associated with the concept of truth that give rise to paradoxes, there's, you know, interminable debates between philosophers about the nature of this concept in part because of these, uh, this defect inside of it. Some philosophers emphasize some of these parts of it other philosophers emphasize other parts of it, and that's the sort of nature of the philosophical debate. And uh, I don't want to necessarily say all philosophical concepts are like that. I think some, you know, maybe maybe some are okay, but certainly the vast majority are defective in this way. Um, you know, one example of a philosophical concept that seems to be in pretty good shape is computability. Even when you try to define it in a different way, you end up with something that's, you know, usually at least equivalent to the uh, the concept that's uh, that's been around for a long time now. So it's, you know, computability seems to be in very in very good shape, whereas a concept like necessity, when you you know look at it in some you know detail, it splits into a million pieces, and there's a bunch of different principles that might or might not be constitutive, and you get a bunch of different versions of it. Okay, so. An inconsistent concept, again, is one whose constitutive principles include something that's false. And it's important to be clear about what a constitutive principle is. A constitutive principle is a partial implicit definition. So it's a, a partial implicit definition. It doesn't give you a full definition necessarily. That means it might you know, require other kinds of claims. Uh, but, uh, but that's the idea is that it's, a, it's some kind of you know, implicit definition. It's important to recognize that constitutive principles on this view can turn out to be false. And so it's not um, gonna be exactly like you know, analyticity or you know, a meaning constituting view that you might be familiar with from the history of philosophy where if something's meaning constituting or something's analytic, then it's uh, guaranteed to be true. That's not going to follow for constitutive principles for me. So um, we can define a constitutive principle in the following way. P is a constitutive principle for X, if and only if. Denying P is a pro tanto reason to believe that the denier does not mean the same thing by the word X as you do. So if someone in a conversation with you denies some principle, and by denying that principle, that constitutes a pro tanto reason, a defeasible reason for you to believe that you don't mean the same thing by you know, the, a particular word in uh, that claim, then 
that's what it is for the principle to be constitutive. It, it uh, denying a constitutive principle gives you a reason, a defeasible reason to change into a different mode in the conversation where instead of thinking about whatever you're talking about, you know, tigers or Ukraine or Wednesday or whatever it is, you start talking or thinking about the meanings of the words involved. And uh, so I, I occasionally say that, you know, denying a constitutive principle is an interpretive red flag. It's a defeasible reason to think that uh, you don't mean the same thing. It can be defeated. Those reasons can be defeated. It can turn out that someone denies a constitutive principle, but still means the same thing that you do. Uh, it's so it's a it's it's not necessarily a conclusive reason. It's a a, 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 a reason that can be overridden by other considerations. Okay, so constitutivity is a replacement for analyticity. And I think that Williamson's work on conceptual truths gives us good reason to not use the concept of analyticity. And let me just briefly lay out Williamson's argument in the 2006, is it 2006 or 2004, either one, uh, called Conceptual Truth. It also shows up in his Philosophy of Philosophy book. So the material shows up in multiple different places. But the idea is he uses a really important example, the Aristotelian conspiracy theorist to undermine the claim that all vixens are vixens is something that is a conceptual truth. And so he first says, look, so imagine someone who is an Aristotelian about, about universal quantification and thinks that all vixens are vixens entails there are some vixens. Now in contemporary logic, we don't have that, but in Aristotelian logic, you do have that inference. So imagine an Aristotelian who thinks that universal claims entail existential claims, the, you know, the related existential claim. And now imagine that that same person who is an Aristotelian about universal quantification is also a conspiracy theorist about vixens and thinks that there are no vixens. There's a big conspiracy. People are, you know, there's a lot of money behind uh, the, the forces that want people to believe in vixens. Uh, but, uh, but it turns out, you know, actually there aren't any. So now you think about the sentence, all vixens are vixens. And according to the Aristotelian conspiracy theorist, it entails there are vixens. And this person doesn't believe there are any vixens. So that person should deny all vixens are vixens. And so all vixens are vixens is something that is a contingent. It's, it's contingent as far as something that you believe when you possess the, the, the other concepts. You don't have to believe that sentence in order to possess all of the concepts involved. And so it's not some kind of conceptual truth that, um, you know, that's somehow undeniable by everybody who understands the, the words involved. You could you know, come up with an example pretty easily where someone reasonably denies that claim. So, so I take that to be, and you know, the, the related moves, you know, that's not his only move there. Williamson makes a lot of other moves with respect to this sort of example, and is a, a really compelling argument against there being conceptual truths and you know, conceptual truths where something's true in virtue of its meaning. And I agree with that. I think that's exactly right. Constitutive principles on the, the way that I'm thinking about them are perfectly consistent with Williamson's um, uh, examples and the arguments that he uses to undermine the idea of conceptual truths. Constitutive principles don't have to be true, they can be false. So um, the I do think of constitutivity as a replacement for analyticity, so I think of what I'm doing right now, offering constitutivity and an, a, a sort of you know special definition of it as a kind of conceptual engineering project. It's a kind of conceptual engineering project that I'm doing in order to build the materials that I want to have for other conceptual engineering projects, like the one with truth or the one with that I'm talking about today, where we talk about, you know, where we, we have in our targets most or all of the, 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 the topics or concepts in philosophy. Okay, so um, one way to think about, you know, analyticity, constitutivity, you know, everything that any, any concept that's in the same, this kind of family is in the business of explaining the difference between belief and me. Now it does other stuff too, but surely this belief meaning contrast is one of the most important things that 
uh, that these sorts of concepts you know, help, it, help us explain. Let me give you an example. So imagine you encounter someone who says something that strikes you as false. So if the words in that sentence that was uttered mean what you mean by them, then the belief that would be expressed is not a belief that you hold. It's a belief that you reject. So you believe the negation. So someone says something that you think is false. Okay. Now, it could be that that person means what you mean, but has a different belief than you have. Or it could be that that person has the same belief that you have and means different things than you mean by the words. How are you supposed to figure out which one is which? You have two different options here for understanding what's going on. S different belief, same meanings, or same belief, different meanings. And the, that contrast is one that, you know, analyticity or constitutive principles um, has been, you know, designed to address. It's a difference in meaning if that person denies constitutive principles for those words. If there's agreement on the constitutive principles uh, for the words involved, then it's a difference in belief and the meanings are in agreement. So it's constitutivity gives us a, an in-principled way to answer this question of, do we blame belief differences or do we blame meaning differences for prima facie disagreements? Okay. Another point to make is that, you know, there's a lot of things somebody could mean by meaning. Uh, in particular, there are extensions and intentions and how do constitutive principles relate to extensions and intentions? So an extension is just a set, a set of items from a domain. The intention is a function from, a wor from worlds to extensions. And neither of those things uh, are, you know, intimately involved with constitutive principles at all. Instead, I see extensions as functioning on one level of explanation, intentions are functioning on a slightly different, more sophisticated level of explanation, and it's senses or concepts or whatever you want to call them that, uh, that I'm aiming at explaining with constitutive principles. So I think of senses, for gaining senses or whatever you, know, whatever you want to call them, something that's at a different explanatory level than intentions as the focus of constitutive principles. So, you know, a, a Fergian sense or concept is uh, determined by its constitutive principles. And then if you wanna know what's the intention of the word uh, associated with, you know, that concept or, or, or sense, then you use the, the constitutive principles to try to identify what the uh, intention is. And then if you understand what world you're in, then you can figure out what the extension is as well. But the, it's the Fregean sense that you know, provides the structure or framework for identifying the intention and the extension of the word in question. Finally, there's a difference between concepts and meanings. Uh, psychology has gone one direction and Linguistics has gone a different direction, where if you think of psychology as studying concepts and lots of other things, and linguistics is studying meanings and lots of other things, then they, they aren't the same. And philosophers have assumed for a long time, you know, in, the, in a sort of, um, in, in, in practice, I suppose, in the way that they, you know, slide back and forth between talking about one thing and talking about another, that concepts and meanings are, you know, more or less equivalent and that you know, they're more or less the same thing, you know, sets of necessary and, condition, and sufficient conditions or something like that. And here I deny that. I don't think that's true at all. And I think that a sufficiently sophisticated and compelling conceptual engineering project absolutely positively has to distinguish between meanings and concepts, at least in certain, you know, ways that it's implemented or uh, in certain ways that it's, that it's applied. Now, for us in here today, this difference isn't going to make a huge difference. There's not going to be a big difference between, you know, talking about conceptual engineering for meanings and conceptual engineering for concepts, which I take to be mental entities. And, um, but I do want to mark that difference. That's a, a difference that, um, that Manuel uh, emphasized way back in his first, uh, first talk for the conceptual engineering seminar way back when. Remember that, Manuel? That was a long time ago. And... Uh, and, uh, and it's been, um, I think, a, a really important lesson 
that you know many members of the seminar have emphasized uh, you know over the years. <clears throat> okay, so. So far, all I've done is explain what I mean when I say that most philosophical concepts are inconsistent. I mean that the constitutive principles for most of the concepts that philosophers study include some false claims and that those false claims are what make the concept defective or, or what have you. So that's really the, the main point that I've argued for so far. And now here comes the second main point. So most philosophical concepts are inconsistent. That's the first one. The second one is that inconsistent concept plus some kind of impediment to inquiry gives rise to a need for replacement. So you might say, well, if most are all inconsistent concepts are inconsistent, sorry, <laughs> most are all philosophical concepts are inconsistent or defective, then shouldn't we replace them all? The answer is no, that doesn't follow. In order to conclude that you need to replace a concept through some kind of conceptual engineering project, you need both that it's inconsistent and that that inconsistency is an impediment to some kind of inquiry or you know, uh, you know, attempt to you know, identify you know, what's, uh, what's really going on, uh, you know, something that's true or false. Now, I think that uh, because of the way I'm using inconsistent concepts to explain philosophical phenomena, like why philosophy is so hard, why is philosophy so hard? Why do we seem to make very little progress in a human lifetime within philosophy? Why do <clears throat> we see um, so much infighting and argumentation about the basics in philosophy, as opposed to, you know, maybe like a normal science kind of situation where most of the people agree on the background and we're just trying to, you know, figure out some of the details. Why, why is philosophy so hard? Well, the answer from my perspective is because the concepts that we're arguing about are defective. And when I present a theory of knowledge that's externalist, I'm focusing on the externalist constitutive principles of knowledge. And when I argue with an internalist about knowledge, they, that person I'm arguing with is focused on different constitutive principles. So they're all constitutive principles of knowledge. I'm focusing on some of them. The, my opponent is focusing on others. And we're each saying, it's not knowledge if it doesn't have this. And we're both right. It isn't knowledge if it doesn't have this, right? The externalist is like, it's not knowledge if you aren't linking you know, the, the connection uh, to, you know, some kind of world involvingness. And the internalist is saying it's not knowledge if you're not linking knowledge to some kind of, you know, responsibility. And they're arguing about the other's point, and each one is right about the concept of knowledge. So it's an easy case to make that in philosophy, the inconsistent philosophical concepts that we philosophers are thinking about cause an impediment to our philosophizing, right? It's an impediment to philosophizing if the concepts that we're talking about are inconsistent and we're assuming that they're not. So the, the I think, fairly straightforward case is most or all philosophical concepts are inconsistent in the way that I've described. And this inconsistency gives rise to a problem, an impediment. It's an impediment to our understanding of ourselves and our place in the world. You know, whatever it is you think philosophy is aiming to, to do. You know, uh, probably my favorite description of the aim of philosophy comes from Wilfred Sellers, where he said, you know, the aim of philosophy is to understand how things, you know, in the broadest sense of the term, hang together in the broadest sense of the term. Well, if the concepts that you're using to, to, you know, if the concepts that you're thinking about and the concepts that you're using to think about them are each defective in the ways that I've described, then that's going to be an impediment to, you know, successfully identifying how it's hanging together in the broadest sense of the term. So whatever it is that you think philosophy is about, whatever you think the goal of philosophy is or whatever, um, it seems pretty clear. I'd be happy to hear a counterexample to this or some you know, criticism of this or objection, but it seems pretty clear to me that you're gonna have um, a pretty easy case for there being an impediment. So that seems like 
once you accept that most philosophical concepts are inconsistent, it's pretty straightforward to get to a large scale replacement project where you say most or all philosophical uh, concepts you know, need to be replaced. So <clears throat> that's the, the, the radical therapeutic program. I call it radical therapeutic program because I'm invoking some ideas from Wittgenstein there, like letting the, you know, philosophy is about showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle. So for me, you know, the, the fact that we, you know, uh, come to the philosophical enterprise possessing a bunch of concepts that are inconsistent and, and allow us to reason ourselves into contradictions. That's the fly bottle. And doing conceptual engineering sufficiently so as to arrive at a consistent set of concepts that we can use to do philosophy with, that's the way out. Okay. So, um, So the final conclusion is most philosophical concepts ought to be replaced. <clears throat> so that's really from most philosophical concepts are inconsistent. If it's inconsistent and there's an impediment then replacement, therefore most philosophical concepts ought to be replaced. That seems like the, the large scale structure for, uh, you know, argument for the, the radical therapeutic program for the replacing philosophy project. Okay, so now, um, I wanted to compare this way of thinking about philosophical, the nature of philosophy with a, a fairly popular alternative called metalinguistic negotiation, which is um, endorsed by David Plunkett and um, a number of other people, uh, maybe Tim Smedell and, um, and others. Uh, the idea behind metalinguistic negotiation is this. When we come to a philosophical topic, a conversation, of, of most philosophical conversations have the following structure. Group, one group of people is arguing with a second group of people, and the first group of people means one thing by some key term, and the second group of people means something different by that key term, and they're arguing about what we should mean by the term. They're implicitly arguing about what we should mean by making what seem like first order claims about the world. So according to the metalinguistic negotiation person, philosophy, most of philosophy really is about conceptual engineering. It really not about conceptual engineering, it involves conceptual engineering. Most of the interminable philosophical debates that we encounter, well, the ones that, you know, the, the, the difficult debates that, you know, comprise most of philosophical discussion, the ones that don't seem to make a lot of progress, the ones that seem, you know, very difficult, the ones that make people think that philosophy is really hard. The metalinguistic negotiation person says that in those conversations, the participants mean different things and they're arguing about what they should mean. Okay. How is that different from my approach? We both like conceptual engineering, right? My approach says that conceptual engineering is the right way to approach these kinds of issues. And if these issues are as widespread as I say they are, then conceptual engineering should be a major philosophical methodology. The metalinguistic negotiation person, so David Plunkett, he also thinks that conceptual engineering is, should be an important, it already is an important element in philosophy. It's just kind of hidden. Where do we disagree? So we both agree that conceptual engineering is an important element in philosophy or should be. We disagree on the following point. When I see epistemologists arguing about internalism and externalism, I think they mean the same thing by the word knowledge. I think they mean the same thing or justification or whatever. Not in every case, of course, philosophers, you know, give idiosyncratic definitions for the, the, the terms that they use and terms they introduce, of course. But if both epistemologists are trying to explain knowledge and they, then in, it, typically they mean the same thing by the word knowledge, but that's a defective concept. That's an inconsistent concept. They both mean the same thing, but they focus on or emphasize different elements of this one inconsistent concept. For the metalinguistic negotiation person, that person thinks that they don't mean the same thing. 
They mean different things. And they're arguing that each one should, they're arguing that that's what they should mean in general. They're arguing what I mean by it is what we should all mean by it. That's the, argue, the overall argument. Now, I think that there's uh, a good reason to, uh, to uh, uh, endorse the radical therapeutic program that I've laid out here today over metalinguistic negotiation. And that's because of the balance between belief and meaning. I think that thinking of constitutive principles as a key to inconsistent concepts gets that distinction between belief and meaning, that, that, that contrast between different beliefs and different meanings, right. Whereas the metalinguistic negotiation person overemphasizes different meanings and underemphasizes differences in belief. So for the, the metalinguistic negotiation person, every, basically every philosophical discussion, the participants in it mean different things from one another, according to the metalinguistic negotiation person. Whereas for me, that's not the case. Now they say, you know, that doesn't mean that that's going to be some kind of, you know, horrible, pointless verbal dispute. And, and that's all really, you know, great work done by the metalinguistic negotiation folks to deny that. And that's, I agree with that. But what I don't agree with is that most philosophical disputes involve people using the key terms differently and they're arguing that that's how they should be used. I think instead that many philosophical disputes, they're using the key terms in the same way. It's just the key term is inconsistent and the beliefs that are being pushed are you know, focus on some constitutive principles for one side versus other constitutive principles for the other side of the debate. So two different ways of thinking about the nature of philosophy from me on the one hand, and the metal linguistic negotiation people, on the other hand, uh, two different ways of thinking about how conceptual engineering is important for philosophy. We both think it's important, but we think that its importance is you know, different in, uh, in the two cases. Okay, so let's look at a couple of objections before we get to the main objection. First one, uh, replacement conceptual engineering changes the subject. This is the Strassen objection. And um, I think that the right answer to the Strassen objection is to say, yeah, and changing the subject is uh, sometimes a perfectly good philosophical thing to do if the old subject is one that presupposes uh, contradictory information. Objection two, conceptual engineering projects are impossible because semantic externalism ensures that we have little or no control over the senses of our words and concepts that we use. So this is Herman Kaplan's objection to conceptual engineering. And I think that I do endorse a, you know, a, a fairly strong version of semantic externalism, but I think that the version that's in play in this objection is wrong. Semantic externalism is the idea or should be the idea that the, you know, the, the external environment plays a role in determining the meanings or of our words, the contents of our concepts, but it doesn't mean that it plays the entire role. And so, you know, you can agree that, concept, that, uh, that the external environment plays some role and still allow for the kind of and amount of control that would be required to implement conceptual engineering kinds of projects. And that's the view that I think is the right one to say about that objection. The um, third objection, uh, aren't we gonna find defects in the concepts that we're using to do conceptual engineering? Yeah, uh, but um, Hopefully, we are designing the right concepts to do conceptual engineering, like the concept of constitutivity, uh, and we can approach those on a sort of case-by-case -case basis as we need to deal with them. So I don't think that this is a reason to uh, give up on conceptual engineering or think that this is a problem for conceptual engineers that is somehow, you know, um, a, some kind of knockdown problem. Objection four, philosophy is not the study of concepts at all, so it can't be the study of what have turned out to be inconsistent concepts. Williamson argues for this point. Philosophers do on occasion study concepts, but only as an item among others in the world. For example, the difference between concept of truth and truth itself. Truth is presumably a property that things like sentences or theories or propositions can have, whereas the concept of truth is something like a mental representation or a some other kind of thing that people grasp or possess or understand. Philosophy isn't the study of the concept of truth, or the concept of knowledge, it's instead the study of phenomena like truth and knowledge and freedom and justice and all the rest. Okay, good. Now, uh, I think that um, I can formulate this point about 
um, philosophy and the study of inconsistent concepts in terms of the phenomena out there in the world, it's just a bit messier, right? So it, yeah, sure, if you wanna think that philosophy studies the things that are out there in the world, the categories out there in the world and their properties, then the view would be something like the ways that we uh, characterize and define these properties or categories are not sufficient to, uh, to actually pick out clear, well-defined categories or properties in the world. So think of the, um, you know, and if that's right, then uh, if philosophy really is supposed to be about the elements of the world and we're not careful enough in the way that we specify them to pick out anything in the world, then it's hard to see what philosophy is actually about on this view. So if it's not really about concepts or meanings in the way that I think it is, then it's hard to see what it's actually about at all. And finally, the objection that we're here to talk about today, the omnicide objection from Patrick Greenough. Uh, I wish Patrick was able to join us, but um, hopefully he'll um, be able to take a look at the, um, the video. So here's the, uh, the, the quick version. Conceptual engineering projects are impossible because replacing one concept or sense requires replacing all of them due to the conceptual connections among them. Here's the version that shows up in Greenough's paper from Inquiry in 2017. The general lesson ought to be clear. If we replace the concept of truth with one or more surrogate concepts, then any concept which is constitutively linked to truth via one of its core constitutive principles must be replaced too. Furthermore, we cannot use the old concept word to pick out this new concept. We must introduce a new concept and word to refer to it. The problem is that not only is the concept of truth constitutively linked to the concepts of provability, assertion, and belief, but is so also linked to myriad other concepts, such as inquiry, objectivity, reality, knowledge, judgment, evidence, justification, confirmation, probability, fact, being, truth, not, truth value, truth bearer, reference, denotation, satisfaction, truth condition, meaning, content, proposition, representation, necessity, possibility, contingency, and more. In turn, these concepts are constitutively linked to a wider class of concepts, and he thinks that replacing truth ramifies and requires replacing all of them. Okay, so my first reply to the omnicide objection. So imagine here um, we have, you know, um, we're saying, uh, you know, X, and we're defining X um, in terms of, you know, some claims and some other uh, concept Y. Um, can you see that or no? Can you see the board okay or no? Yeah, okay. Um, now, uh, this, so this is, we're implicitly defining X in terms of Y. This is a constitutive principle, uh, constitutive principle, uh, and it's, uh, it's giving an implicit definition of X in terms of Y. Okay, so now <clears throat> it might very well be that we need to characterize constitutive principles not as constitutive or not, that's not the way we think about it. Constitutivity isn't just a property. Rather, constitutivity needs to be a two-place relation where we think of something as constitutive or the constitutive ascending truth and descending truth that I introduced are constitutive principles only for those words. They're not constitutive for other terms that show up in those principles. And they're not just constitutive full stop. They're constitutive for a particular, but that's exactly what you wanna have in a situation where you're trying to the, of the difference between you know, something that you know, we're, we're going to blame the difference in meaning uh, uh, for, uh, you know, some disagreement. Specificity in the notion of uh, constitutivity in order to provide a decent action. So my response, my first response to Patrick, and this is what's in, in print, is his account assumes Activity is just on or off, when actually it's for some word that is the operative notion that needs to be. So, I my example 
examples that I gave is like, um, um, cats are not, cats are not robots, uh, seems like it's constitutive for cat, uh, but it doesn't seem like it's uh, constitutive for the word not. So um, if I told you, you know, some cats are robots, you wouldn't be like, oh, well, you must not mean what I mean by the word not. So it does seem like we have this phenomenon that's out there. It seems like we need constitutive 4x in order to capture it. And so it's a nice independently motivated reply to the objection. Okay, so, but now, <clears throat> Kimon, uh, Sourless uh, uh, Sour Katsumanis, in, uh, in this very seminar a few years ago, uh, I believe it was back in 2018, noticed a big problem with this uh, approach. So here's how to describe the problem. So imagine we have you know, truth, meaning, um, proof. Kevin, I'm whatever. sorry. Um, it Kevin, can you hear yeah. me? Oh, sorry, that's hardly readable. Maybe not you, readable. You have a, read it, it. a bit. Uh... Better? Not, that's not even better. Wow, it's, terrible. It's, it's too light, the color. It's too late, too. All right, well, but I mean, we, we can guess what, what is written. Okay, I'll do it like this. So, here we have a bunch of concepts that are old and they're linked to each other through constitutive principles. Imagine we introduce the two new concepts for to replace truth with, right? So, we have ascending truth and descending truth they are linked to some of these old concepts constitutively. None of the old concepts are constitutively linked to the new ones. Right? So when we define these, we implicit, partly implicitly define them by using older concepts. And we're saying replace this concept of truth with these two guys in certain situations. But the thing that Kimon noticed was what we don't have these guys the old concepts being implicitly defined in terms of the new ones that's what we don't see and so when we follow the procedure that i've advocated what we end up with is two different i guess categories of concepts we have the old concepts that are fully integrated implicitly defined in terms of one another. And then we have the new ones, which are no old ones, are implicitly defined in terms of the new ones, even though the new ones can be implicitly defined in terms of the old ones. So we have this split in the conceptual scheme between the ones that are fully integrated and the ones that are not fully integrated. And so I thought this was a great objection. And uh, it's been, you know, bothering me for a while, and uh, <laughs> so what, what I wanted to do is, you know, think about a couple of ways of responding to it. I'm super happy that uh, Kimon's here, so that, he, um, you know, he'll hopefully tell us in the Q&A what he thinks about the replies. So here's one thing that we can do. <clears throat> First, we can deny that full integration is a necessary condition. So we can just deny that you know legitimate concepts need to be fully integrated in the sense that the old ones, some of the older ones, are implicitly defined in terms of the new ones. So, for example, I looked up uh, something like uh, try to find a decent example of some scientific concept, and I came up with quark color charge. Okay, so quark color charge is the co the color charge of a quark is this complicated thing having to do with particle physics, and my guess is no uh, non physics concepts are partly implicitly defined in terms of quark color charge, not one. Now, I'm happy to be uh, wrong about this, but that's my guess is that that doesn't happen at all. And so quark color charge is like this. It's in the new 
the new category where none of the old concepts are implicitly defined in terms of it. So it seems to me like, um, like non-integration, you know, denying full integration is a perfectly reasonable response and say, yeah, this is how our conceptual scheme is set up in other ways, in other places, and it's fine for it to be set up in this, you know, two-tiered way here. It's what you see when you have technical concepts that aren't in uh, wide usage. Okay, second option, the second reply that I have is to focus on the dynamic element of concept change and meaning change. So yeah, if you think of concepts as just sitting there pristine and not changing at all, and then all of a sudden Kevin comes along and says, let's change truth. And then you see that change like, you know, sweep through the entire rest of the conceptual scheme that's just sitting there quietly, statically, not doing anything. Um, yeah, that does seem bad, but that's not accurate. What's accurate is our concepts and meanings are changing all the time. They're changing constantly. They're constantly in flux. And so even if I suggest changing truth, and even if Patrick is right, that changing truth is going to change the concepts that are constitutively tied to it, and it'll change those that are constitutively tied to those, uh, those changes might very well get wiped out by other changes that are happening in our conceptual scheme at the same time. And so I like the analogy I want you to think about is imagine throwing a pebble into a still pond, right? You can see the wave of the pebble run you know, through the entire pond. That's the sort of image that we're getting from the objection. But instead, you should think about throwing a pebble into uh, uh, a stream or a brook or a burn that has rapids. And there, when you throw it in, you see one little splash, but it doesn't run through the entire thing. The, 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 way, the little wave, the little perturbance, the little disturbance gets wiped out by the other changes that are happening in the water nearby. So I think of the second one as the right way to think about uh, conceptual engineering changes, even if Patrick is right on, uh, on the, the omnicide <clears throat> considerations. So, so the first point is, to, is meant to, um, <clears throat> to soften you up. Uh, this doesn't, the, the Kimon version of the objection doesn't seem as bad as it, um, you know, upon reflection <clears throat> as it really is. Um, sorry, what do I want to say? <laughs> sorry. The, the Kimon objection isn't as bad upon reflection as it seemed originally, is what I want to say. Um, that's the first reply. The second reply is uh, a sort of bullet biting reply. Yeah, it does make changes, but the changes aren't going to ramify in the way that you're assuming because it's not the case that our concepts are just sitting there statically like a, like a, like a, a calm pond. <clears throat> and then the final uh, reply is also on the handout, and that's to deny spread. So here's a principle that I want to endorse first. X is implicitly defined in terms of Y, but not in terms of Z. Now we implicitly define X in terms of Z as well. Do we thereby replace X? Yes. So if we add a new constitutive principle for X, then we have thereby replaced X. A change in the constitutive principles is a change in its meaning or the concept. Now, uh, here's a, a, an assumption that seems like one at play in the objection. If X is implicitly defined in terms of Y and we replace Y, have we thereby replaced X? And the answer is no. So what I wanna do is look at an example, uh, example about brothers and male siblings. Now, <clears throat> I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm of the opinion that um, conceptual engineering can do a lot for helping to understand our, um, the difference between sex and gender, gender, terms and the way gender terms are currently being um, utilized in a sort of culture war against, um, against uh, underrepresented groups, including trans people. And I think that conceptual engineering can say something you know, important and, and illustrative about the, the current situation, but, but I'm not going to focus on that issue here. And so when I have the example, a brother is a male sibling, you could, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm using male as a, um, as a you know, it, it's a sex term rather than a gender term. And um, I only did that because I wanted the example to be clean. If you don't like the example, then it's easy to come up with a different one. But, so here's the words. Imagine uncle, brother, parent, 
uh, whoop, brothers on their sibling and male uh, interdefined. You know, so uh, the main focus is that a brother is a male sibling. So the principles, principle one, X's male sibling is X's brother. And principle two, a brother of X's parent is X's uncle. Now, in this, in this system, replace the concept male with a new concept called it Zale. And I'm not going to tell you what Zale is. Imagine, you know, maybe it's for like artificial intelligence or aliens or something like that. Do we have a new constitutive principle? Namely, X's Zale sibling is X's brother. And the answer is no. Constitutive principles are individuated semantically, not syntactically. We still have the same meaning for the word brother. We have two meanings for brother that we could possibly choose. The male sibling meaning, call it brother M, and the Zale sibling meaning, call it brother Z. So replacing a concept does not thereby replace all those partially impl implicitly defined in terms of conceptual replacement need not spread. So that's a really important point to have is that, you know, when we have a conceptual engineering project for a concept Y, and there's another concept implicitly defined in terms of it, we don't necessarily change that concept implicitly defined in terms of it. So that's a mistake that the concept, the omnicide objection uh, uh, assumes. Here's a, a counter objection. I can imagine the Kimon uh, you know, pushing this counter objection. But conceptual engineering is often phrased in terms of the concepts or meanings that we ought to use. So aren't we supposed to male instead of male? Wouldn't that go for defining brother as well? Think of the example where I say, look, I'm going to hold on to the, to the definition that Pluto is the ninth planet from the sun. And you'd be like, but didn't they redefine planet? I'm like, well, I'm going to use the old definition of planet. Right, so when I say Pluto is the ninth planet from the sun, I mean the old notion of planet. And you're like, but you're not supposed to be using the old notion of planet. You're supposed to be using the new notion of planet. That's why they replaced that so that it would do a better job of explaining, or, you know, describing the world. So aren't you supposed to be using the new one and not the old one? That's the, the, the sort of idea of the, the counter objection here. The reply is that using an inconsistent. So for the truth example, you only need to use sending truth and ending truth, you're only ought to use semantic need to use descending some person, some some someone that you both know is um, reliable or truthful, uh, use the concept of truth. You don't need ascending truth and descending truth for that. Um, so the point is that it's just in a certain circumstances. Um, Zale ought to be used in circumstances. Otherwise, it may be, sorry, ought, I'm going to have, Zale ought to be used in circumstances C. Otherwise, um, uh, male may be used, is what I want to say, is giving a partial implicit definition of brother in those circumstances C. If not, then there's no at all, and there's no spread of any kind. Further objection, even if replacing male with Zale doesn't force a change in the word brother from brother M, you know, defined in terms of male to brother Z defined in terms of Zale, it surely suggests making a change here. So it doesn't force a change, but it suggests making a change. My reply is, yeah, that does seem right, but it's not necessarily even suggest making a change further out at uncle. So at uncle, we don't even get a suggested you know, two different meanings for uncle by changing uh, our conceptual scheme to replace male with zale. So we have male and zale, and then brothers defined in terms of that, and then uncles defined in terms of brother. We don't even have a suggested change in uncle two spots out. So for all, my response to the omnicide objection is, this is a big problem. I thought that it was dealt with. Kimon showed me I was wrong. And it's a real, a serious thing that needs to be, you know, addressed seriously. But I think that there's three, you know, plausible responses that we could give. The conclusion, right? There's you know, Kimon's version of the omnicide problem. So denying full integration is necessary. That's a live option. Denying that spreading conceptual changes are necessary outcomes is a live option. 
and biting the bullet and downplaying the effects by emphasizing that concept mean dynamics is a live option. So those three options, I think, are live options for dealing with this, um, this big worry. But I haven't seen this worry show up very much in the literature. And I don't think it affects only me. It affects anyone who's engaged in replacement type conceptual engineering, just those who think that most are all philosophical concepts. So overall today, I've argued for and uh, provided a, a bit of elaboration on the radical therapeutic program, what, which says that um, you know, most or all philosophical concepts are inconsistent and ought to be replaced. And, um, and I've looked at a major problem for this approach, which is the omnicide problem. I told you what I said a few years ago in response to it. I also told you why Kimon convinced me that that was efficient as a response. And so today I've laid out what I think are reasonable live options for uh, any conceptual engineer who's worried about this problem, respond to it. And, and I th think is you know, one of the major um, you know, important ways of defending uh, the, uh, the, the project of replacing philosophy. So that's it for the talk. Thanks so much for um, Q and A. And again, just, you know, thanks. I, I, I appreciate it and, uh, and you too appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you so much.